Hello, fellow teachers, and welcome to Teaching with Power. I'm Ben Wilcox, and I'm really looking forward to spending some time with you in Genesis 3 through 4 and Moses 4 through 5 today. And I have to begin by giving you a heads up that today's video is going to be a little bit longer than usual. I just couldn't see any other way around it. There is just so much meat and good stuff in these chapters that I've decided to cover a little more than usual to help you as a teacher make a more informed decision on what you eventually end up deciding to cover in your own classes. And remember that my goal with these lessons is not only to give you insight into the scriptures, but also give you effective and tested ideas and materials that can help you to teach those insights to others in relevant and meaningful ways. And if you find this video helpful, the best thing that you could do would be to share it with somebody else. I also hope that if you haven't already, that you'll subscribe to the channel and join me again in the future. That's what helps the channel to grow. Now, if you're ready for a big week, grab your scriptures and your marking pencils. It's time to dig deep. Now, if you compare Genesis 3 through 4 to Moses 4 through 5, you can see just how much additional material is provided by the Pearl of Great Price on the same subject matter. Latter-day Scripture really helps us to understand this part of the Gospel narrative. So for simplicity's sake, this week we're going to stick exclusively to the Book of Moses account, since it's the most complete version of the two. And to start out this lesson, I usually like to begin with a magic trick. I'm somewhat of an amateur magician, and I've found that it's a great way to grab your students' attention. In previous videos, I've already taught some simple yet effective magic tricks. So instead of taking the time to rehash them here, I'll just provide you with some links to those videos in the video description below. And then I'll also provide you with a new one. I'll give you a link to a really great simple trick that I found that requires no practice at all, yet I still think is, is really effective. It's a disappearing coin trick and it's super easy to put together. There'll be a link to that video in the description as well. But after the trick, I like to ask them if they know the names of any great magicians. Houdini is always going to come up. They might say David Copperfield, Penn and Teller, David Blaine. These are people that we would consider to be great magicians. But then I like to tell them, that they have yet to name the individual who I consider to be the greatest magician of all time. Because what is magic? It's deception. It's the art of making people believe something that isn't really so. If you started the lesson with the cup and coin trick, then you could admit to them that you actually didn't make the coin disappear. It was an illusion. It was a trick. Now, most magic is just harmless entertainment, but there's another magician out there, a deceiver, who is an expert at tricking people into believing things that just aren't so. And who am I talking about? That, of course, would be Satan, the greatest deceiver of all time, the greatest magician of all time. In today's lesson, we're going to observe this magician at work. We're going to watch him in the act of deceiving the first people to live on the earth, Adam and Eve and Cain. And we're going to scrutinize how he works in the hopes that we won't be deceived by the same kinds of tricks. You know, if I were to show you how the trick that I do at the beginning works, then you wouldn't be deceived by it in the future would you? I mean, you could just laugh at me and say, you can't fool me. I know how that works. I'm not going to fall for it. Hopefully, after we study Satan today, we can do the same thing with his temptations. We can say, ha, that might have worked on Cain, but it's not going to work on me. I know the trick, and I'm not going to fall for it. And I know that studying Satan may sound a little diabolical and counterintuitive. I mean, why would we want to spend our time learning about the enemy, about the adversary? Wouldn't our time be better spent talking about good things and God and the gospel? 
Yes, but it's good to know your enemy. The better you know your adversary, the better prepared you'll be to face them. In football, coaches will spend hours upon hours watching film of the opposing team before they actually play them. And they do that so they'll be better prepared to face them. And that's what we're going to do today. We're going to watch film of the adversary at work here in the book of Moses. And the way we're going to tackle this study is with this handout. This is what I call a thinking map. I'll hand this out to my students at the beginning and ask them to do their best to use the scriptures to fill it in. The given references are going to help you to find the answers. And you can have them work either personally or as a companionship or as a group. But be sure to tell them that the goal is not to get it right. Uh, if they struggle with it a little bit, if they come up with different answers than you have, that's okay. This handout's just a means to an end. Its, it's purpose is to help them to think about the scriptures, to get into the scriptures and study. So just encourage them to do their best. And, and then later, you'll go over the sheet together as a class, hopefully sparking some, some class discussion. And the handout is divided up into different sections. You have Satan's titles, attributes of the evil one, how Satan works, and how to destroy a soul in 12 steps. And if this seems like too much to cover in one class period, just have them do the part to the left of the Satan picture and then save the cane activity for another day or maybe not at all. The area I believe you'll want to spend most of your time in is in the How Satan Works box. But let's begin with Satan's titles. Satan has a number of different titles or nicknames that are assigned to him in the scriptures. And that's the title we're going to begin with here. In chapter 4, verses 1 and 4, he's referred to as Satan. But before he ever became Satan, he went by a different name, Lucifer. And the name Lucifer, if you examine its Latin roots, actually means the light bearer. And what that tells us is that before he became Satan, Lucifer was an individual with great influence and potential, a light bearer, somebody we looked up to as an example. And it's obvious that we looked up to him because many people followed him when he rebelled. They gave up their opportunity to experience mortality and receive exaltation just to follow. And when that rebellion occurred, his name changed. He became Satan, not the light bearer anymore. And if you look up the word Satan in the Bible dictionary, you'll find that it means the slanderer. And that might help us to understand a little bit more of the nature of Satan's rebellion in the pre-mortal world. In the process of his mutiny, he slandered somebody. And to slander is to make false or accusatory statements to damage a person's reputation. So who was Satan slandering? I guess we don't know. Could it have been the father for choosing Christ instead of him? For setting up the plan the way he did? Maybe. Was he slandering all of us? That we wouldn't be able to live up to the commandments? That we would fail? Perhaps. But I think that the most likely person he was slandering was Jesus Christ possibly accusing him of not being able to perform the atonement, that we were all fools to put our trust in him and hang our salvation on his willingness and his ability to make that sacrifice. Whichever it was, his slander was egregious enough and memorable enough to forever label him as Satan, the great slanderer. Another one in verse 4 here. Satan is the devil. And what does devil mean? Go to the Bible dictionary again. The Hebrew form of the word means spoiler. What a great word to describe him. Satan is a great spoiler. He spoils lives, marriages, friendships, innocence, faith, love. He enjoys watching good things turn bad. Therefore, he's a devil. There's another one in verse 4. He's also referred to as the father of all lies. 
And that's a good magician title, isn't it? A magician does not tell you the truth. They deceive with their words and their actions. Once a magician friend of mine told me that 80% of the effectiveness of a magic trick was based on something called patter. Now, patter is what a magician says, not what he does. And I believe it. The words of the trick, in my experience, the power of suggestion, the the lies and the half-truths that the magician uses, contribute greatly to whether it really works or not. Satan understands that principle too. And maybe you're familiar with some of his most famous lines of satanic patter. For fun, let's just see if you can complete them. Fill in the blank. It's not that bad. Everybody's doing it. You can always repent. Just this once. It's no big deal. No one is ever going to find out. Rules are meant to be broken. These are just a few examples of some of the lies that Satan tells, because he's the father of all lies. Last one from verse 5. Here, Satan is referred to as the serpent. Now, I don't believe that Satan actually appeared as a snake in the Garden of Eden. I just think it's a title or a figurative expression that the Lord uses to describe him. Now, why of all animals would the Lord choose the snake as a symbol for the devil? Not that I have anything personal against actual snakes. I think they're wonderful creatures. But I can see why they would be good figurative representations for Satan. And here's a couple of ideas. He's hard to detect at times. He, he sneaks up on us very carefully and quietly. Like, like Nephi tells us that he, he likes to lead people carefully down to hell. Snakes live low to the ground, in the dust. Now, Satan does have power, but it's lower than God's, or even lower than ours. He can bite our heel, but we can crush his head. But even so, snakes can kill people in two main ways, poison or strangulation. Both of these are methods that kill slowly over time. So that's how Satan works. Satan slowly wraps himself around us, strangles out the good and the spirit from us. He poisons by degrees, just like he did Lahontai in the Book of Mormon. It's a little by little process with most. And then another idea, snakes have forked tongues. That's that's an expression in and of itself for lying. You say one thing, but you mean another. All right, the next category here. Let's go to attributes of the evil one. Now for his attributes, uh, uh, these are verses that will describe things about him or what he's like. And so if you read verse one, after you read it, I would surmise that he is prideful and selfish. Those seem to be Satan's first sins in the pre-mortal world. Perhaps as a son of the morning, he got a little too stuck on himself and his influence on others. Remember that the purpose of the great council in heaven was not to present plans and then vote on whose plan we thought was the best. God had already decided on the plan. The question wasn't, what shall I do? It was, Whom shall I send? Satan changed the topic and presented what he felt was a better plan. Now, now can you sense the pride in this verse? Just look at all the I's and me's in there. Here am I, send me. I will be thy son, and I will redeem all mankind. That one soul shall not be lost, and surely I will do it. Wherefore, give me thine honor. It's a lot of eyes and me's. Sounds pretty self-centered. And when he says, give me thine honor, I don't think he means give me your throne, God, or, or let me take your place. I think he means give me the honor of being the Savior. I don't think he wanted to be the Father as much as he wanted to be the Son or the Redeemer. 
And that's why he hates Jesus so badly. And, and then he adds to that, I'll do it in a better way, in a way that nobody will be lost. And verse 3 tells us how he planned to accomplish that. All we have to do is take away agency. And with that, all sin is immediately eliminated. Everybody gets exalted. And on the surface, I admit that that sounds good. But underneath, it's completely diabolical. It defeats the whole purpose of the plan. How can we become like God without an ability to act? We'd basically be the same kinds of thing as animals or inanimate objects. As Lehi taught in 2 Nephi 2, there are two kinds of things on this earth. Things that act and things that are acted upon. Satan's plan would have us made us into things that are acted upon. And, and really, it wouldn't have worked. His plan was a lie from the beginning. Plus, keep in mind that you can destroy agency in more than one way. I think we usually assume that Satan meant forcing everybody to do what was right. But you can destroy agency differently. You can destroy it by removing law altogether, or our knowledge of good and evil, or removing consequences. Each of those is going to destroy agency. We wouldn't be held accountable. Plus, if there's no sin, there's no need for an atonement either, which could probably have been a major motivation behind his idea. And that's the way he tempts people today, too, isn't it? He's always promising happiness and joy and reward without the need for obedience, without the need for sacrifice. But that's contrary to the nature of the universe. Wickedness never was happiness. Satan's plan was a lie. What do we learn about him in verse 5? He's subtle. That's a magician word, isn't it? To be subtle is to accomplish something through clever or indirect means. Satan's temptations are often very subtle, rather than in your face or obvious. From verse 6, we learn that he doesn't know the mind of God. Satan doesn't have the power to see God's thoughts or his intentions. I also think that could be a way of saying that Satan just doesn't get it. He doesn't understand the overall purpose of the plan in the first place. Why else would he propose the kind of plan that he did? He doesn't see things eye to eye with God and disagrees on how they should be done. All he could focus on was reward or the outcome. Hey, let's just assure exaltation for everyone. He thought that we should get something for nothing. Forget the wisdom that comes from experience and effort. Just give me what I want now without the work. Many of Satan's temptations here on earth still follow that same pattern. You can have money without work. So just gamble or steal. You can have sexual pleasure without commitment. So commit fornication. You can have the good grade without the studying. So cheat. You can commit the sin, but suffer no consequences. So lie about what you've done. That's how Satan works. And you know, I just had to throw this last one in here too. 2 Nephi 2.27 From this verse, we learn that Satan is miserable. And he wants misery for everybody else too. He was like, Oh, so you won't give me what I want, God? Well, I'll show you. I'll try to mess up the salvation of as many of your other children as I can. What a miserable motivation. Why would anybody choose to be miserable? When their pride and selfishness become even more important than their happiness. That's Satan's attitude. I may be miserable, he says, but at least it's my choice. Let's move into this next category. How Satan works. How does he tempt people? What are his tricks? It's in his bag of tricks. So here we go. From verse 3. Rebellion. Satan is the ultimate anti-authoritarian. He's always encouraging rebellion. This is what he did in the pre-mortal council in heaven. He rebelled against God's authority and urged others to rebel as well. Maybe it would be better termed the rebellion in heaven rather than the war in heaven. To Satan, 
Any authority is bad authority. Don't tell me what to do, he tempts us to say, regardless of whether the authority is benevolent or not. Kids, rebel against your parents. Members, rebel against your church leaders. Citizens, rebel against your government and the law. Don't let anyone tell you what to do. That is a very satanic attitude. Also in verse 3, Satan tries to destroy the agency of man. Satan didn't only seek to destroy our agency in the pre-mortal world. He continues to do so. Satan is all about addiction. And what is addiction but a loss of agency? People say, I just can't seem to control myself in this thing. I can't stop, even though I want to. When people are drunk or they're high, they've lost their agency. They often don't even know what they're doing. When people lie, the lie begins to control them. When people are in prison because of their crimes, they've lost their agency. The ironic thing is that Satan always promises freedom at the same time he's putting people in bondage. He's always saying that commandments and standards and rules are bondage. God's always telling you what to do. You can't do anything. Go out and do whatever you want. Then you'll be free. Well, take a look at verse 4. He leads people captive at his will. His will. So Satan doesn't care about your freedom. He wants to control you. And we're going to see that this tactic plays a major part in the fall of Adam and Eve and in the story of Cain. In verse 4, go a little bit quicker here. He deceives people. That's a magician word. He blinds. Satan doesn't want us to see the truth. His works are often done in the dark, in the shadows. That's why sin is often committed behind closed doors. He sends mists of darkness to blind or obscure the way. It's also why he stands in opposition to seers. He doesn't want us to see. Also in verse 4, he leads people captive at his will. In verse 6, he draws people away from God. He beguiles. That's another great magician word. And then also in verse 6, he seeks to destroy the world. Now let's stop and talk about how Satan hoped to do this for just a second. I've often had students ask what Satan was hoping to accomplish by getting Adam and Eve to partake of the fruit. I mean, wasn't that really advancing God's plan? Didn't that just play into what Heavenly Father wanted to have happen anyway? Didn't Satan have to do what he did for the plan to work? Well, maybe he did it so that he could get started on tempting people? Maybe. Is it because he didn't really understand? He didn't know the mind of God? Possibly. But allow me to offer you one other thought. And I'll do that by asking you a question. Was there any possible way for Satan to have frustrated or ruined the plan of salvation? Were there any loopholes in its framework? And the surprising answer is yes. There was. There was one way that Satan could have ruined the plan. And what was it? You got to go to the Book of Mormon for the answer. Go to Alma chapter 12, verse 23, and then verse 26. And in verse 23, it says, And now behold, I say unto you that if it had been possible for Adam to have partaken of the fruit of the tree of life at that time, after partaking of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, there would have been no death, and the word would have been void making God a liar. For he said, If thou eat, thou shalt surely die. And then in verse 26, And now behold, if it were possible that our first parents could have gone forth and partaken of the tree of life, they would have been forever miserable, having no preparatory state. And thus the plan of redemption would have been frustrated, and the word of God would have been void, taking none effect. Well, the conditions in those verses sure sound like things that Satan would have desired to have happen, right? He would have loved to have made God's words void, to make him a liar, to make us forever miserable and frustrate the plan of salvation. And what was the way that he could do that? All he needed to do was to have Adam and Eve first partake of the forbidden fruit, 
and then immediately go and partake of the fruit of the tree of life. Then they would have lived forever in their sins. Well, obviously, God wasn't going to allow that to happen, and it seems from the accounts we have of the Adam and Eve story that the Father shows up fairly quickly after they've partaken of the forbidden fruit. It's also the reason why God places an angel with a flaming sword at the tree of life to protect the plan of redemption from being frustrated. So maybe that's why Satan did what he did in the Garden of Eden, his motivation. That was the first of two steps that could have destroyed the plan. Regardless if that's the reason, I think it's a perfect example of how Satan works with us, too. He tempts us to partake of forbidden fruit and then swiftly moves us on to the next temptation and the next and the next. If I can get them to do this, then maybe I can get them to do this next. Satan tried to frustrate God's plan with Adam and Eve and was unsuccessful. However, Satan can frustrate God's plan for us if we allow him to. He wasn't able to make all God's children forever miserable, but he can make us forever miserable. He couldn't make God a liar, but he can try to make you a liar. He couldn't make God's words void, but he can make a void in our lives where God belongs. Let's not let that happen to us. All right, down to verses 7 through 11. This is a big one. This is what I would call the first temptation, the first magic trick Satan ever performed on this earth. And to understand it, we got to first go back to Moses 3, verses 16 through 17. I like to start by asking my students how many trees there were in the Garden of Eden. Sometimes they say just one or two, the tree of knowledge of good and evil and the tree of life. But remember, it was a garden. There were lots of trees in the Garden of Eden, lots of fruit trees even. And in those two verses, which does God first introduce to them? The trees that they could eat from or the one that they weren't supposed to? Let's find out. And I, the Lord God, commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it. Nevertheless, thou mayest choose for thyself. Where's the emphasis? Where does he draw their attention? On all of the wonderful trees that they could partake of. You can eat from this tree, Adam, and that one, and that one, and this one. All are available to you. Freely eat from them. Enjoy them. However, there's just this one tree that I'd like you to avoid. But all the rest, be my guest. Now contrast that with Satan's approach. Where does Satan draw the attention? Now go to Moses 4, verse 7. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? Now at first glance, I know that sounds like he's drawing attention to the trees, but I don't think so. I place the emphasis of his tone in that way. Hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? Can you eat from all the trees, Eve? Can you sense the subtlety in that? He's carefully leading her to think about the one tree. He says tree, singular. He wants her to bring it up instead of him. It's very sneaky, very subtle. And Eve does respond initially with the proper attitude. Notice how she begins by referring to the trees, plural, in the garden. And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which thou beholdest in the midst of the garden, God hath said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. Aha! So now she's brought it up. And where is Satan going to direct all her attention now? To the one tree that they are forbidden to partake. So what does he say? And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. So, Eve, this is the fruit you want. God's lying about it. He's just trying to control you. 
He's trying to hold you back from all the benefits and the pleasure of this tree. God's so restrictive, isn't he? You can't do anything. Now, I'd ask my students, does Satan still use this tactic on us? Oh, you bet he does. Where is he always trying to direct your focus? On all the wonderful and amazing things that we can do or the few that we shouldn't? He's always focusing on the don'ts, isn't he? You disciples of Christ can't do anything. No partying, no swearing, no sex before marriage, no tattoos, no drugs, no pornography, no dating before you're 16, no gambling, no alcohol, no coffee even. You can't do anything. God is holding you back from all the fun and pleasure that the world has to offer. God knows this. Or the prophets or your parents. They just want to control you. Satan loves to invent power struggles. He loves to call the motives of those who love us into question. These so-called authorities, he whispers, know the fun that these trees can offer. Or they just don't get it. They're old-fashioned. They're out of touch with reality. Don't listen to them. And I would respond, don't listen to him. Don't fall for it. He's the liar here. In this world, there is so much more that we can do than we can't. We've got to learn to focus on the trees and not the tree. God does not micromanage every decision of our lives. He doesn't tell us what career to have, what pastimes or subjects to pursue. He doesn't tell us how to live every day of our lives. He gives us choice and agency. He says, be anxiously engaged in a good cause and do many things of your own free will. There are just a few things that I want you to stay away from. Some forbidden fruit. For your own good and happiness, I might add. So, choose your dress and appearance. Your favorite colors. Your favorite styles. You can dress more casually or formally. Like a cowboy or an athlete or retro. Just don't dress immodestly. That's all. There are lots of things you can drink in this world. Find your favorites. Milk, fruit juice, Gatorade, hot chocolate. Just don't drink alcohol. Go out and enjoy all this world has to offer. Go out and choose your favorite hobbies or sports activities or musical instruments to play or not play. Just don't do certain activities that hurt others. Or yourself. There is a lot out there that is not a matter of right or wrong, but preference. We've got a lot of freedom. Got to recognize that. Please be careful not to fall for the first temptation. Focus on the trees, not the tree. Now, the one from verse 11 we already mentioned, and that is he likes to invent a power struggle. Uh, the power struggle between us and those who truly love and care for our well-being. In verse 12, this is what I would call the pathway of sin. There's a lot of verbs that describe how Satan leads someone into sin in this verse. And although we understand that the fall was a necessary part of the plan, and that what Adam and Eve did in partaking of the forbidden fruit, I wouldn't classify as a sin. But still, this verse is a good description of how Satan draws somebody into sin. Each verb describes a different part. So you've got the word see. First, he draws your attention to the sin and tries to place it before your eyes. Nowadays, media is often the vehicle that Satan uses to present his sins and lies. That's why we've got to be really careful about what we watch and read and listen to. Then it became pleasant. He makes it look appealing. He places enticements in front of us. Tells us all the good things that we'll get by partaking of it. Makes it look enjoyable. And of course, those pleasures or good things are often short-lived, but lead to long-term misery. Then comes the desire. Those enticements will often instill a desire within us to partake. And then they took and ate. At last, Satan finally convinces us to commit the sin. But it doesn't end there. Eve then gave unto her husband. Satan then usually tempts us to involve others in our sins. 
He recruits us to do his dirty work, to try to convince others to partake also. The process doesn't even end there, though. What does Satan entice us to do after we've sinned? Go to verses 13 and 14. He tells us to cover it up or hide it. Adam and Eve realize that they're naked and seek to cover themselves. And then they run and they hide. Remember last week how we talked about the symbolism of nakedness as a sign of shame or guilt? Because honestly, I don't think that they were ashamed because they were naked. I mean, they were the only two people on the earth at the time. There's nobody to see them. Plus, they were husband and wife. But rather, I think they realized that now they were open to God's judgment. They were responsible for their actions. They could be held accountable to God. And that can be painful and shameful and make you feel vulnerable. So Satan tells them to cover and hide themselves from God. He wanted them to think that that would be a better option than facing God. Satan tempts us to think this way too. When we're guilty of sin, he'll tell us to keep it a secret, to continue in the sin without allowing anybody else to find out, to cover it with lies and secrecy under the cover of darkness or behind closed doors. I think it's interesting that Adam and Eve sow fig leaves together to cover themselves. We, too, are sometimes tempted to sow fig leaves for ourselves. The fig leaves of excuses, lies, blame, or trying to eliminate the whole idea of right and wrong altogether. And with Adam and Eve, how good of a covering do you think that really was? It doesn't sound very comfortable or effective. Leaves eventually die and crumble. It's an ineffective short-term solution to a long-term problem. So is hiding our sins. It just won't last. When God comes to speak to Adam and Eve, I think they quickly realize just how foolish it was to be hiding from God. And so they come out. And I can just picture Adam hiding behind a rock or a tree and then saying, well, this is kind of silly. God's omniscient. He already knows everything. What am I doing back here? Well, we do well to realize the same thing in our sins. We may be able to hide our sins from others or even church leaders, but we can't hide them from God. God gives us a much better solution to dealing with our sins. But we'll take a look at that a little later. In verse 13, Satan tempts us to believe it not. So Satan is staunchly anti-faith. And then also in verse 13, he tempts us to become carnal, sensual, and devilish. So he says, satisfy your senses and your carnal desires. He's all about the natural man. It's only natural to give unto anger and lust and greed and pride. You have no choice but to give in. How can God expect you to do otherwise? See, again, Satan wants to relegate us to the position of animals who only act on instinct and impulse. Never mind that as humans, we have a gap between stimulus and response. We have a chance to choose and exercise our will and act on the desires of the saint or the spirit that's within us. Satan wants to deny us our humanity. Well, now our final section with Satan. And this is focusing on the story of Cain and Abel. This is how to destroy a soul. And it's such a tragic story because there's so much hope at Cain's birth. Eve says, I have gotten a man from the Lord, wherefore he may not reject his words. Sadly, that's exactly what Cain's going to do. The story of Cain is a perfect study of sin we get a chance to see how Satan can manipulate someone into a loss of their salvation. This is how he makes someone miserable like unto himself. Uh, I call it how to lose your soul in 12 easy steps. So we'll watch line upon line how Cain ends up becoming a servant of Satan. So on the handout, the activity has you putting the steps of the story in chronological order. You look at the given verse and then match it to the step that's being described. 
So step one from verse 516, develop a zone of vulnerability. And that first step is really a beginning point for all of us. The fact is that we all have zones of vulnerability. We all have weaknesses and areas where we struggle because we're human. Therefore, we all need to be on our guard for the adversary. We need to recognize our weaknesses and know that Satan is going to try and take advantage of them. What was Cain's weakness? I would say it's apathy. He says, who is the Lord that I should know him? That's the, I just don't care approach to spirituality and the commandments. And that's a really tough attitude to treat. How do you get somebody to care? Once the desire to follow God is gone, it's very difficult to get it back. So be very careful of apathy. Step two from verse 18, allow Satan to exploit the weakness. And at face value, the temptation in this verse sounds really strange. Go make an offering to God. That actually sounds like a good thing. And it, and it is. But Satan knows something about Cain. He's apathetic. So how do you think that offering is going to go? Not very well. And when it says that the Lord had respect to Abel's offering and not Cain's, it's not because God's playing favorites. Like, oh, I like your offering, Abel, but not yours, Cain, because I like Abel better than you. Now, th there's a reason behind it. There was something not right about Cain's offering. Was it spoiled fruit? Was it not the best? Was it a small offering? Whatever it was, it wasn't acceptable probably as a result of Cain's apathy towards the things of God. So step three, verses 20 to 23. Uh, take offense when you're confronted with the truth. Verse 21 tells us that Cain was very wroth at God's reaction, and his countenance fell. He takes offense at the consequences of his poor decision. Those that are already on the fence when it comes to the things of God tend to get easily offended when they're confronted with the truth or face correction. But God loves Cain, and he's hoping he'll turn his attitude around. That's why he teaches him the great lesson, or the great truth, of verse 23. And honestly, you could possibly classify this as the theme of the book of Genesis, the theme of the entire Old Testament, or life in general. What is that lesson, that theme? Start in verse 22. And the Lord said unto Cain, Why art thou wroth? Why is thy countenance fallen? If thou doest well, thou shalt be accepted. And if thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door, and Satan desireth to have thee. And except thou shalt hearken unto my commandments, I will deliver thee up, and it shall be unto thee according to his desire, and thou shalt rule over him. So, if you're not willing to be obedient, Cain, then Satan's going to exploit that. He's going to get the upper hand and take advantage of it. He will overcome you. But if you do well, you'll be accepted. Confrontations with the truth can often be a painful moment for the sinner. Hopefully, and I believe that this is what God was hoping in the case of Cain, we'll just acknowledge that truth. We'll be humble. We'll change. Or on the other hand, we can get offended by the truth. We can get angry with it. We can resist it. And that's what Cain does. He gets wroth. But keep in mind, this is not too late for Cain here. The Lord is not condemning him. There's a way out. God says that these negative consequences will only come except thou repent. So the Lord's hand of mercy is extended out to him. But what does Cain do next? Verse 25. He rejects that counsel. Just like Satan did with Adam and Eve, he'll tempt us to believe that the counsel is coming from a place of a desire to control. Satan will get us to think, I don't need your help. Who are you to tell me what to do? And that usually leads to our next step in verse 26. Cain completely disconnects himself from the influence of God and those who follow him. He stops listening to the Lord's voice. And someone who stops listening to God can't be helped by him. 
So we stop praying. We stop studying our scriptures. We stop going to church. We stop listening to the prophets. We look for any excuse to dismiss or invalidate the message of the messenger. Since the truth and our actions aren't in harmony, we find it much more comfortable to just plug our ears than to listen to that voice. Next, in verse 28, Cain gets married in this verse. And the scriptures say that together they love Satan more than God. Step six is to unify with others like you. Probably tells you something about the character of Cain's wife. What probably attracted him to her in the first place? She probably felt the same way about God as he did. So, to feel better about our poor decisions, we try to find an echo chamber of people who agree with us and mirror our discontent. We surround ourselves with those who share our displeasure with the things of God. Remember that the group of friends that you choose to associate with will often determine the path that you take. Then step seven from verses 29 to 31, commit to evil. This is where things get really serious. Satan comes to Cain and says, swear unto me by thy throat. Oh, doesn't that just sound so evil? Evil has its own counterfeit covenants. But this is not a covenant of the heart or a promise of the soul, but a swearing by the throat. This is the beginning of secret combinations. There comes a point when people have so lost the spirit that they completely give themselves over to evil. They completely lose a desire to do good, and they selfishly decide that they are going to act only in their own self-interest regardless of the effect that it has on others. They lose their humanity. I would say that most murderers and thieves and serious criminals have reached that point in their lives. Cain here commits himself to Satan and even glories in his wickedness. So our next step, commit the serious sin. At, to this point, Cain hasn't committed the crime yet, but it's been leading up to it. Satan has carefully and slowly led him down the path of darkness to the moment of action. So Cain commits one of the greatest crimes a person can commit in mortality. He murders his brother Abel. And look at his initial reaction. It's chilling. What does he say? I am free. And I can just picture Satan in the background rubbing his hands together and whispering, you are mine. <laughs> That's how the devil works all the time. He promises freedom at the same time he's wrapping us up in chains. And sin is usually accompanied by that moment of excitement or exulting or pleasure. It just doesn't last, though. Cain doesn't even end up getting what he murdered for, which is usually the case with sin. What was his motive? He wanted his brother's flocks. He murders to get gain. All who sin have some gain in mind that they're hoping to acquire. People wouldn't sin if there wasn't some hope of getting something out of it. Unfortunately for them, they always get a lot more than they bargain for. So step nine, verse 34. The Lord is not oblivious to Cain's deed, so he comes to him. And just like he did with Adam and Eve, he gives him a chance to confess his crime. He doesn't come accusing, just asking hoping for him to acknowledge it. Instead, Cain lies and tries to hide it. When God asks him, Where is Abel, thy brother? He says, I know not. Am I my brother's keeper? And that's an interesting question. What's the answer to it? I can see the Lord saying, Yes, Cain, you are your brother's keeper. We are all our brother's keepers. We all have a responsibility to care for and look out for others, especially our family members. Hopefully we don't take a Cain attitude in life towards our fellow man. And in that statement, uh, we discover that unlike his parents, Cain is not going to take responsibility for his actions. He's going to try and hide it. The truth is we may hide our sins from others and from priesthood leaders, but we can't hide them from God. Verse 39 even has Cain acknowledging that truth. He says, 
for these things are not hid from the Lord. And Cain never takes responsibility for his action. So step 10, verse 38, we feel worldly sorrow when the consequences come. In the previous verses, 36 to 37, we see the Lord explaining the consequences that Cain would face for his crime. Sin brings penalty and misery. But does Cain stop and think about the life he's taken? Does he contritely ask the Lord for forgiveness? Does he recognize the pain that he will cause his parents? No. He's still only thinking of himself. He pouts and he grumbles. My punishment is greater than I can bear. This is what we would call worldly sorrow as opposed to godly sorrow. It's a focus on the worldly temporal consequences of our actions, rather than the fact that we've offended God, broken His commandments, or hurt other people. So this all leads to the final result for Cain in verse 41. He is completely cut off from the presence of the Lord. He reaps complete spiritual death and a separation from God and his people. Cain has now lost his soul. This is the final state for all those who refuse to repent. And, ah, oh, I wish it could just end there. But unfortunately, there is one final step to examine. The rest of the chapter shows the evil influence and effect that Cain has on his children and on his children's children. One of his descendants is a man named Lamech who also commits murder. And eventually, their works and abominations begin to spread among all the sons of men. Cain perpetuates evil into the next generation, and the next, and the next, until his influence has spread among all the sons of men. Such a, such a sad story. Please, as you look at that list, heed the warning of Cain's life at every step of his downfall. Instead of doing what he did, we can learn from his bad example by just doing the opposite of those 12 steps. These could be the 12 steps of saving your soul. So, seek to turn weaknesses into strengths through the power of your faith. Don't fall for the exploitation. Resist temptation. Choose not to be offended when you're confronted with the truth. Listen to God's counsel when you make mistakes. Always hearken to the voice of the Lord. Unify yourself with the righteous. Commit yourself to God through sacred covenants. Do acts of righteousness and service. Take responsibility for your actions and seek to be your brother's keeper. If you do sin, be sure to repent with godly sorrow. Remain in God's presence and perpetuate righteousness into the next generation by teaching your children the gospel. I know there's been a lot of truths and principles that we've discussed here, but if I had to boil it all down into just a few statements, here's what I would highlight. What we can do to not be deceived by Satan's tricks. Don't rebel against benevolent authority. Obedience equals freedom. Focus on the trees, not the tree, and don't sow fig leaves to cover your sins. And then we could add all the implied actions we just learned from the story of Cain and Abel. Now have your students answer the following questions in a study journal or on the back of the handout. Of all of these actions, which did you most need to hear today? And then complete the following sentence. Because of this lesson, I will blank. Well, I hope that this activity hasn't been too depressing or discouraging for you. It's not very fun to talk about Satan and deception, but it is important. I don't want you to be fooled, and neither does your Father in heaven. On occasion, I have actually revealed to people the secret behind one of my tricks. Surprisingly, it's often a bit of a letdown for people. The explanation is often so simple and unspectacular that they feel a little foolish for having fallen for it. 
I sometimes wonder if at the final judgment, when all of Satan's tricks and delusions are revealed, if those who have been deceived will have a similar experience. Only it's going to be so much more tragic because the consequences are eternal. I remember a number of years ago, there was a television program called Magic's Greatest Secrets Finally Revealed. And in that show, a masked magician exposed many of the tactics and skills that magicians use to perform their tricks. There's a reason why he wore a mask. He was worried about the backlash from the magic community. And it did make a lot of magicians very angry and even prompted some lawsuits. They had to scrap a lot of their tricks because of that program. They weren't able to get away with the deception anymore. Well, spiritually speaking, that's what the scriptures do for us and the prophets and the spirit. Sometimes I like to hold up my scriptures or a conference edition of the Liahona or the For the Strength of Youth pamphlet and say, Satan's greatest secrets finally revealed. You don't have to be deceived. You can see Satan for what he really is. He's a phony. He's a liar, a charlatan, a fraud. Don't allow him to swindle you out of your eternal salvation. Trust in the Lord. And I know that you will never be fooled by the greatest magician. There is one additional insight that I'd like to share with you about Satan before we move on. I sometimes get this concern from students over the existence of Satan. It goes something like this. Brother Wilcox, didn't God need Satan to rebel so that the plan would work and we could be tempted and tested here on earth? Didn't God intend for Satan to rebel or even create him to rebel? It just had to happen, right? My response to that question is one of my own. I ask, well, do we really need Satan in order to use our agency? The answer is no. We can still make choices without somebody there to entice us to one or the other. There is a natural opposition in all things. I can still choose between good and evil without somebody there trying to get me to choose one, which makes it harder to make the choice. Also, remember that we all have the natural man inside of us as a condition of mortality, and we can't just blame Satan for all of our poor choices. I really don't think that if Satan had not rebelled, or if he had humbly accepted God's rejection of his idea, that God would have had to have said, uh-oh, well now what are we going to do? We really need a Satan for the plan. Uh, any volunteers? Anybody want to be Satan? No, God didn't create any of his children to fail. His work and his glory is to bring to pass the immortality and eternal life of all of his children. So, was Satan and his rebellion even necessary for the plan at all? I don't think so. In the pre-mortal world, Satan used his agency to rebel. Does that mean that there was another Satan above him or below him in order to make that possible? Again, I don't think so. Now, Satan, because of his actions, has certainly made an indelible impression on the plan, and we would do well to understand the part that he's playing in it. But we don't need him. We just don't know exactly how things would have been otherwise. All we know is what is. But I really believe that you have to take the necessity of Satan idea off the table, or you end up with a God and a universe that's responsible for creating evil. And that, to me, just cannot be. God's responsible for creating agency, but not evil. Now let's step away from Satan and examine the more positive side of things now. Let's look at Adam and Eve themselves and the way that God works with them. As an icebreaker, I sometimes like to show my students a few little videos from YouTube. I show them a clip of somebody skydiving or bungee jumping, and they're having a blast doing it. And I tell them, that's an example of a good fall. Then I show them a little clip of somebody falling off their bike or their skateboard or skiing. And there's plenty of those on YouTube to choose from, trust me. And then I say that these are examples of bad falls. Then you put up a picture of Adam and Eve and ask, which was this? A good fall 
or a bad fall? Today, we're going to settle that debate once and for all. Much of the Christian world views the fall of Adam and Eve in a very negative light. They believe that God never intended for them to partake of the fruit, and that mortality is all kind of one big mistake that God has had to compensate for ever since. Eve is often condemned, seen as a deceived woman who spoiled Eden. But does that make any sense? That God would punish the entire world for millennia because a woman ate a piece of fruit? Doesn't sound like the kind of God that I believe in. <clears throat> no, there's much more at work when it comes to the fall than the traditional Christian view. As members of the restored Church of Jesus Christ, we have the benefit of understanding the fall of Adam and Eve with much greater light and knowledge. We know that the fall was an essential and necessary part of the plan of salvation. President Oaks taught this. It was Eve who first transgressed the limits of Eden in order to initiate the conditions of mortality. Her act, whatever its nature, was formally a transgression, but eternally a glorious necessity to open the doorway toward eternal life. Adam showed his wisdom by doing the same, and thus Eve and Adam fell that men might be. Well, to better understand how this came about, I like to do this little search activity with my students. I number them off, assigning each as ones, twos, threes, or fours, and tell them that there were four initial commandments that God gave to Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. These were the first commandments. And what are they? Well, whichever number they're assigned, the matching reference is what they're going to look up. Those four commandments are, in Moses 2.28, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. In other words, have children. Also from verse 28, have dominion over the earth and all that is on it. Take good care of this world that you've been given. That's what we talked about last week. In Moses 3, verse 17, don't eat forbidden fruit. And then there's one that's often forgotten because it's stated after the fact. We know from something that Adam says in chapter 4, verse 18, that God had commanded Adam and Eve to remain together. God did not want them to separate, but to stay together. Now, something that I often like to point out about these commandments is to ask them if they still apply to us today. Or were these just temporary instructions for Adam and Eve only? Interestingly enough, each of those commandments still applies. We are still commanded to multiply and replenish the earth. We still have a stewardship or dominion over the earth. We're still told not to eat forbidden fruit. And when married, we should seek to remain together. Remember that the Adam and Eve story is meant to be representative of us all. Now, as you look at that list of commandments, you may notice something that seems out of place. There's an aspect of the fall that often confuses my students. They sometimes wonder about the relationship between commandment one and commandment three. Adam and Eve could not have children in Eden. They didn't have that ability until after the fall. And so my students wonder about these seemingly contradictory commandments. Why would God ask them not to do something when he really intended them to do so? I mean, was it like putting a piece of chocolate cake in front of the child and, and saying, no, I'm going to leave for a minute, but don't eat the cake, wink, wink. And then you run around the corner peek in and jump out and say, aha, if they touch it, hoping that they will. I really struggle with that portrayal of our Heavenly Father. Sounds like a tricky God. And I don't believe that God tricks people into doing things. But how do we explain this? Well, I'm not suggesting that I know the answer, but let me offer you an idea that has helped me or that makes sense to me. I believe that when God asked Adam and Eve not to partake of the fruit, that he meant it. When he says that in the day they partake of it, they shall surely die, that wasn't a misleading statement. That was God's way of explaining the nature of mortality. Partaking of the fruit would make them mortal, and mortality means the certainty of physical death. Not immediately, but eventually. 
So he informs them of their agency and tells them not to partake of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Well, then Satan comes along and we know how the rest of the story goes. But did God intend for Satan to do this? Was this act of the devil something that was part of the plan? Hmm. Now remember, I don't believe that Satan is necessary for the plan. That suggests that there was some other authorized way for the fruit to be offered to Adam and Eve. What we possibly have going on here is a matter of timing. God did not intend for them to partake of the fruit at that time. And you know, God often works with his children like this. In time, God may have commanded them to partake of the fruit or explained in more detail the nature of their decision. However, in this case, they hearken to the voice of Satan. Satan always tempts people to do things in a way or at times or in degrees that aren't commanded by the Lord. There are some things that are wrong at one time, but completely right at another. It depends on the timing. Having a sexual relationship with someone at one point can be serious sin, but at another, completely appropriate. At most times, killing is condemned. But there are times when even that is acceptable to God, like in defending your country as a soldier or as an officer in the line of duty. Could something similar be going on here? I imagine that there would have been further instruction revealed to Adam and Eve at some later point. And what Satan did was to usurp a power and an authority that wasn't his to use. He was not the one intended to give that instruction. That was somebody else's job. And that would explain why he's punished and cursed after the events in the garden. In fact, for those of you that are endowed, if you pay close attention to something that Satan says right after the fall, it seems to suggest this. Now, if you'll forgive me for the reference, there is a scene from Star Wars, The, the Return of the Jedi, that kind of reminds me of this situation. In the scene, we find Luke talking to Yoda and asking if Darth Vader is really his father. He says, is this really true? And Yoda says, your father, he is. And then he adds, unexpected this is and unfortunate. And Luke shoots back and he says, unfortunate that I know the truth? And Yoda responds, no, Unfortunate that you rushed to face him, that incomplete was your training. Not ready for the burden, were you? Maybe that could shed some light on the Adam and Eve situation. Maybe God didn't really intend them to face that yet, to know that truth quite yet. There were other things he intended to teach them first or prepare them with. Or maybe he just hoped they could have spent a little more time in Eden before having to go out and face the trials and burdens of mortality. So the way the fall on this earth did take place was perhaps not part of the original plan. Still, the result was the same, and I think that God allowed it, just as he allows Satan to tempt all of us. And again, I don't claim to know all the reasons behind the ins and the outs of the fall. But this explanation seems to make sense to me. It's just impossible to know what would have happened otherwise. All we know is what did happen. In our study of Satan, we saw that he tempts us to be ashamed and to hide when we sin. But how does God handle sin among his children? Read Moses 4, verses 15 through 19 for the answer. And what we don't see here is an angry God coming down and yelling at them or hurting them or telling them that they're worthless and how disappointed he was in them. No, he comes down and encourages them to come forth and explain what happened. Now, God already knows what happened, but he gives them the chance to confess. And that's what God does when we sin. Yes, he already knows what we've done, but he wants to give us the chance to take responsibility for our actions and unburden ourselves of their weight. He knows that confession is liberating and healing. So he says to us, don't hide your sins from me. Don't let your past actions eat away at your peace of mind. Don't believe Satan's lie that you're not worthy of my love and my help. Just come forth. If you hide from me, I can't help you. 
Let's talk about this. Let's get it resolved. And that's what happens with Adam and Eve. They do come forward and confess, unlike Cain. Some wonder if verses 18 through 19 are an example of the blame game or passing the buck. Adam blames Eve and Eve blames the serpent. But I don't think that's what's going on here. Adam and Eve are simply explaining what happened. They tell God why they ate the fruit. She gave me the fruit and I, personal responsibility, ate it. Not, she made me do it. And then Eve rightly explains that Satan tricked her. And she too says, I did eat. So there's no rationalization there. Adam and Eve own up completely to their actions. Now jump ahead to verse 27 briefly. What does God do for them here? Well, remember those fig leaves of theirs probably didn't do a very good job of covering their nakedness. That was an uncomfortable and temporary covering at best. Same with us. We don't do a very good job of covering our own sins. So what does God say? He says, I'll give you a better covering for your sins. Something that lasts. Something more comfortable. Something of my making. And he gives them coats of skins to wear. Now think about that for a moment. In order for them to wear skins, what would have to happen? An animal would have to be sacrificed, right? That's the atonement, isn't it? The Savior would sacrifice his life in order to provide us with a suitable and proper covering for our sins. That's what the word atonement means, to cover. And I don't know about you, but I know that I've tried fig leaves in the past. I've tried to to cover up my sins uh, or solve my own spiritual problems without God. It doesn't work. But I've also felt the warm, comforting, suitable covering of the Lord's atonement in my life as well. It feels good to be covered by the Savior's love and God's mercy. So when we sin, let's allow God and Jesus Christ to cover them for us and not use flimsy fig leaves. Now, we can't know for sure, but I wouldn't be surprised if the skins that were provided for them were lamb skins. That would be fitting, wouldn't it? As they symbolized the great sacrifice of the Lamb of God. Another truth, transgression and sin do bring consequences. And those are going to be explained here in verses 20 to 32. Now, your students have already been assigned a number between one and four. So give them another assignment and examine the results of the fall for these four different entities. What was the effect the fall had on each? So you've got Satan in 20 and 21, Eve in 22, Adam in verses 23 to 25, and in verse 28 and 31, the tree of life. So first, Satan. And we've already spent a long time talking about Satan today. So just briefly, we know that he's cursed, but still given a measure of power to bruise our heels. But we can bruise his head. Let's talk about Eve, though. God says, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. In sorrow thou shalt bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. There are a couple of difficult words in this verse. First of all, sorrow. In the original Hebrew version of the Bible, the word that is used there it gives more of a connotation of work, labor, and worrisomeness, and not so much sadness and pain. And I know this part may come off a bit that way, but I don't believe that this is God punishing Eve for partaking of the fruit. He's not, he's not saying that he, he's going to make childbearing more difficult and painful because of what she did. Satan is the only one that's directly cursed for what took place in the fall. What's really going on here is God explaining the conditions of mortality. He's saying, Eve, this is what it means to be mortal. I want you to understand that bearing children is work. It's hard. And raising children will also bring worry and labor into your life. Another troublesome word to people in this verse is in the last sentence. Thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. Now, I bet you can guess what the troublesome word is. 
hits rule. Thy husband shall rule over thee? I think that's the wrong word to focus on. Look more closely at that sentence. There's another, much better word to explain the relationship between husband and wife. It's desire. Thy desire shall be to thy husband. It softens the other word. The relationship between husband and wife is one of desire and love and commitment. The word rule, then, is just another word for preside. A father presides over his household in love and righteousness. This isn't a punishment for Eve and all women, but God's declaration of differing roles between genders, as are explained in the family proclamation. And then now God's going to explain the major conditions of mortality for Adam. Mortality would also mean work and labor for him too. You see the word sorrow in his explanation too. Again, I don't believe that that's so much sadness and pain as much as it means work. Adam, you're going to have to work to provide for yourself and your family. Life is going to be full of challenge and effort and labor. Now quickly, the tree of life. As we discussed earlier, had Adam and Eve been able to partake of the fruit of the tree of life after the tree of knowledge of good and evil, the plan would have been frustrated. Therefore, cherubim, or angels and a flaming sword, are placed there to keep that from happening. There's another phrase that I want you to take a look at, verses 29 through 31. There was another consequence of the fall for both Adam and Eve. They would not be able to stay in the Garden of Eden. And you have two phrases describing how that took place. In verse 31, the Lord says, I drove out the man, which sounds a little harsh as if he spitefully pushed them out or forcefully had to remove them from the garden. I kind of like the way he says it in verse 29 better. I, the Lord God, will send him forth from the garden of Eden. Doesn't that have so much more hope and potential in it? We're going to send them forth into the world to make their own decisions and experience life. It's like what we do as parents. Eventually, we send our children forth into the world to live their lives. To reinforce that idea, we could add the way that Alma says it in Alma 42, verse 2. Now behold, my son, I will explain this thing unto thee. For behold, after the Lord God sent our first parents forth from the Garden of Eden to till the ground from whence they were taken, yea, he drew out the man, and he placed at the east of the Garden of Eden cherubim and a flaming sword. So again, sent forth from the garden. And also I like, he drew out the man. I like to emphasize that phrasing more than he drove them out. Now, with all these consequences and conditions, are we to get the impression that life is just work and difficulty and sorrow? No. After they've begun to live their lives for a while, look at how Adam and Eve begin to see their decision to leave the Garden of Eden for mortality. Go to Moses 5, verses 10 through 12. And in that day, Adam blessed God and was filled and began to prophesy concerning all the families of the earth, saying, Blessed be the name of God. For because of my transgression, my eyes are opened. And in this life, I shall have joy. And again in the flesh, I shall see God. And Eve, his wife, heard all these things and was glad, saying, Were it not for our transgression, we never should have had seed and never should have known good and evil and the joy of our redemption, and the eternal life which God giveth unto all the obedient. And Adam and Eve blessed the name of God, and they made all things known unto their sons and their daughters. Did you notice the word that both Adam and Eve used to describe mortality? Joy. Yeah, life is work and labor and challenge, but it's also joy. Adam fell that men might be, and men are that they might have joy. I mean, is having children a punishment? A bad thing? A curse? No, it brings joy. When I held my my son for the first time, I felt unspeakable joy, as with all of my children after. And what about work? Is work a bad thing? A consequence? A punishment? No, work is good. It can also bring joy and fulfillment. In fact, research has shown that people are much happier when engaged in work that is meaningful and challenging to them than they are in consuming passive entertainment. 
Raising children is good. Work is good. Life is good. Despite the difficulties each of those things can bring. So the truth, the fall was a necessary part of the plan of salvation. It was a good fall. When I sin, if I confess and repent, then the mercy and power of the atonement will cover me. The consequences of the fall are blessings, not curses, that allow us to learn and progress, have children, and work. If I understand the purpose of life and its challenges, I can have joy, even though it can be hard. And to liken the scriptures, what about Adam and Eve do you admire most? Well, it should be apparent to members of the Church of Jesus Christ just how important the Adam and Eve story is to us. We've got four versions of it. Genesis, Moses, Abraham, and the temple. Not to mention many other places in Latter-day Scripture that comment on Adam and Eve and add to our understanding. So I hope that we'll honor our first parents. And I know that I can't wait to meet them. They must be amazing souls to have been given that privilege and responsibility of bringing mortality to pass. They deserve our respect and appreciation, not criticism. I also hope that we can view the challenges of mortality in the same light that they did. To see the roses past the thistles and the thorns and to approach life with a sense of joy and optimism. One of the things that I love most about the temple is how it brings those two personalities to life. I see myself in Adam and my wife in Eve. They've taught me for years. And I imagine they'll continue to teach me new things in the future. But before we conclude, I'd like to provide you with one more quick thought and activity that you could do with your students. Last week, we talked about the importance of marriage and what Adam and Eve can teach us about successful marriages. Here's a continuation of that thought. Togetherness is important to God. Remember that one of the first commandments of this earth was for Adam and Eve to remain together. When Adam discovers that Eve has partaken of the fruit, he had a decision to make. Would he stay in the Garden of Eden alone or accompany Eve into the lone and dreary world? Remember Adam's explanation for why he partook of the fruit. The woman thou gavest me and commandest that she should remain with me. She gave me of the fruit of the tree and I did eat. I believe that's a beautiful thought for married couples. Adam chose Eve over Eden. He chose the person over the paradise. Adam knew what was more important in this case. It was his relationship with his wife, not his ease and comfort. What's the secret to having a remain with me kind of marriage? I think it comes in doing things together. In Moses chapter 5, I found six different things that Adam and Eve do together that I believed helped them to remain together. And you could do this as a handout. But can you find them? They labor together in 5.1. In verse 2, they have children together. In verse 4, they pray together. In verse 5, they worship together. In verse 12, they teach their children together. And after Cain rebels, in verse 27, they mourn together. I believe that the more of these kinds of things we do together as husbands and wives, the stronger our marriages will be. And we can have remain with me marriages. And one final note, you may wonder why I haven't said anything about the first portion of chapter 5, where Adam and Eve are offering sacrifices. I've decided to include that in next week's lesson on Moses chapter 6. It fits very well with a lot of the things that are taught in that chapter, and I think we'll have a little more time to do that next week. So I promise we'll do that in the following week. And that's all I have for you today. Uh, thank you so much for bearing with me this week. There's just so many good things in these chapters. I really enjoyed spending this time with you. If uh, you would like access to any of the resources that I create for teachers, the handouts, the slides, the, the lesson plans, go to teachingwithpower.com and there'll be links to those resources. Thank you so much for watching. Now get out there 
and teach with power.